Well, I'm so excited to be here giving honor to God, our pastor and leading lady in their absence. Um, I am just grateful for the opportunity to stand before you in a different capacity um, and just to deliver the word. There is a word from the Lord. If you don't mind standing for me as we get ready to reverence and read the scriptures, we're going to come from 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 28. We also give honor to my wife who is here. Wave your hand, sweetie. God bless. Hallelujah. So 1 Samuel chapter 17, uh, we're going to start at verse 28. I'm going to read um, uh, quite a few verses. So I'm going to speed read so your feet don't start hurting. <laughs> um, if we're going to read from the New International Version. If you have it, you can signify by saying, I have the bread. You have the bread. 1 Samuel Chapter 17, starting at verse 28, it commences by saying, When Eliab, David's oldest brother, heard him speaking with the men, he burned with anger at him and asked, Why have you come down here? And with whom did you leave those few sheep in the wilderness? I know you, how conceited you are and how wicked your heart is. You come down only to watch the battle. Now what have I done, said David? Can I speak? He then turned away to someone else and brought up the same matter. And the men answered him as before. What David said was overheard and reported to Saul, and Saul sent for him. David said to Saul, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. Saul replied, you are not able to go out against this Philistine and fight him. You are only a young man, and he has been a warrior from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it, and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. The uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from from the hand of this Philistine. Saul said to David, go and the Lord be with you. Then Saul dressed David in his own tunic. He put a coat of armor on him and a bronze helmet on his head. David fastened on his sword over the tunic and tried walking around because he was not used to them. I cannot go in these, he said to Saul, because I'm not used to them. So he took them off. Then he took his staff in his hand and chose five smooth stones from the stream, put them in a pouch of a shepherd's bag, and with this sling in his hand, he approached the Philistine. Meanwhile, the Philistine with his shield bearer in front of him kept coming closer to David. He looked David over and saw that he was little more than a boy, glowing with health and handsome, and he despised him. He said to David, am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? The Philistine cursed David by his gods. Come here, he said, and I'll give your flesh to the birds and the wild animals. David said to the Philistine, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day, the Lord will deliver you into, the into my hands, and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. This very day, I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds and the wild animals, and the whole world will know that that there is a God in Israel. If I could put a, a title on this text, it would be, you're the right one for the job. Do me a favor and just be a preacher for five seconds. Look at somebody and say, you're the right one for the job. You may be seated. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, Lord. You are my strength and my redeemer. Amen. You are the right one for the job. I'm excited about being able to expound upon uh, this text today, and I hope that you would afford me the opportunity uh, to take a rather non-traditional approach to this text, as I believe that this is a very familiar passage of Scripture. Um, it contains what is most likely the most popular story amongst the Christian community. We talk about David and Goliath in our nursery uh, rhymes and schools, our children's church settings. We sing songs about giants falling. We even quote popular phrases about giants falling. We say the bigger they are, the harder they fall. Yeah, we use this particular story as a metaphor 
um, to fit our own life's intricacies. And we always put an emphasis on Goliath and how David had this epic, uh, unbelievable, supernatural moment where he took his slingshot and five smooth stones to take down this giant. And we'll get to that part of the story eventually because it is important, but I would like to focus primarily this morning on David and what we can learn from the events leading up to the climax of the story. There are things pertaining to David that show us that we are the right ones for the job. And if I may take some prophetic uh, privilege this morning, I believe that there are individuals here this morning who find yourselves in a season where you are facing a job, an obligation, um, or even an assignment that seems too big, too large, or too major for you to tackle. I'm here this morning for the people uh, that you know whatever you're facing, it must be handled, it must be addressed, and it must be conquered because there's too much depending on whether you take action or not. Am I talking to anybody in here? Because let me be clear that our lesson this morning may not be so much about the giants and the trials and the tribulations that we face in life, but more so about being able to conquer those giants in order to fulfill the mandate on your life that is bigger than yourself. For example, some of you know in this season that God is probably shifting you into a new career path, but that giant that you must conquer might be having to deal with the fear of going back to school. You get what I'm saying? Some of you, God is called to jump out of, on faith and start maybe that business or uh, that new career, but, but, but the giant must be that you have to conquer the anxiety or the word curses that people spoke over your life, saying that you're not good enough and you'll never be anything or you'll never be successful. But whatever it is, let this be your sign this morning from God that you are the right one for the job. Whatever the job may be, whatever the calling may be, whatever the assignment may be, you might not have it all figured out, but you know God has called you to something or some place greater than you are right now. You don't have to have it all figured out or all mapped out, but what you do have to realize is that conquering your giants in this season will be the prerequisite to fulfilling God's purpose for your life. Now, let me give a little history lesson and set the scene, because if you take the time uh, to research and read the chapter before this in chapter 16, you will discover that by this time now, the by the time the Philistine giant comes, God has already rejected Saul as king over Israel. The prophet Samuel has made his way to the pasture and found David to be God's chosen one and now has anointed him to be king of Israel, yet while Saul is still officially occupying the space. This is important. But even though David might not understand the full scope of his calling or the full weight of his assignment, and even though he is not yet occupying the office of king, he still has been anointed by God. And with that anointing, saints, comes an innate purpose and a passion that drives him in chapter 17 to want to lead Israel to victory. So even though it's not David's time to be king, hear me, he still has a burden for for the things of God and for the people of God simply because he's been anointed by God to walk out his assignment. And here it is. One of the ways you can know that God has chosen you or called you or anointed you to do something is by the burden or the passion he has placed in your heart concerning that particular thing. And so because David has been anointed by God in chapter 16, here in chapter 17, he finds himself volunteering and passionate about leading the people of Israel to victory over Goliath and the Philistine army. Hear me, because there are about 50 people in here that are going to be blessed by what I'm about to say. David was not the king. He was not a general in the army. He had no high-ranking position in the army. He wasn't even a soldier in the army. He had no equipment to fight with, nor did he have any armor uh, to wear. But one thing he did have was the anointing. 
Y'all missed it. And I came to encourage somebody this morning that the anointing that you have is enough to help you fulfill your assignment. The anointing that you have is enough for the task at hand. The anointing that you have is enough to help your journey through life's mountains and valleys. What is the anointing, saints? The anointing is when God's hand is on my life. Look at somebody and say, I have the anointing. I have, I have the anointing. I might not have the education but I got the anointing. I, I might not have the credit score, but I got the anointing. I, I might not have the credentials, but I got the anointing. I, I might not have the popularity, but I have the anointing uh, because it's the anointing that makes a difference. You can have the fancy jobs and you can have the fancy houses and you can have the fancy cars, but at the end of the day, I got to keep my anointing. It's the anointing that makes the difference. It's the anointing that destroys the yoke. It's the anointing that severs the ties. It's the anointing that breaks the chain. Look at somebody and say, you've got the anointing. Because God's hand is on your life. And so David is now operating in the anointing without having a title, oh Lord. Because when, when you have been anointed and called and chosen by God, you oftentimes, hear this, find yourself doing the work before you possess the title. <laughs> but that might confuse many of us because nowadays we don't want to do the work until we get the title. But when you have been picked by God and picked out and chosen by him to lead, you have a burden on your life to do his work, you end up walking in the capacity without the recognition because God is looking for people in this season that's not looking to be in the limelight, not looking to be impressing other people, not looking to be on stage, but simply looking to please God because you have to realize is that you have been anointed by God to do the work, not just to have the title. You've been anointed by God to put your hand to the plow not just to be seen. You've been anointed by God to affect change in this dying world, not just to have your name in shining lights. Because God said in this 21st century, we have already have too many people who have titles, deacon so-and-so, pastor this, apostle that, evangelist this, reverend that, and they couldn't even cast the devil out of an ant, let alone pray you through your bondage. We have titles, but we have no fruit, but the devil is a liar. Look at somebody and say, we got work to do. We got work to do. I feel Mr. Preach coming on now. The one thing you have to mention is that David, I have to mention is that David is not trying to overstep. He's not trying to dethrone Saul. He's not, he's not trying to outshine Saul, but David is simply embodying what the scripture says that your gift will make Oh, we got some Bible readers. Your gift will make room for you and bring you before great men. I'm almost done. If you, if you missed it, you just missed it. So, so just give me 10 more minutes. We'll unpack this and then we'll, we'll go. I got to switch gears now. So you know I'm a, I'm a storyteller. You know I love to retell the story in my own way. It's called the gospel according to Jamie. I hope you, hope you know it. So I've given you the backstory, But now here in our text, what you laughing at now? In 1 Samuel chapter 17, the writer here is telling us now that a battle is brewing on the front. The tensions between the Israelites and the Philistines had reached its boiling point. Philistines, the Bible says, were occupying one hill and the Israelites were occupying another. And the Bible says that there was a champion by the name of Goliath. It says that he was six cubits tall he wore a helmet and armor weighing 5,000 shekels, and a portion of his spear weighed 600 shekels. And this means nothing to you until I put it into layman's terms. That means he was over nine feet tall with armor that weighed about 100 pounds or more. And so he wasn't, he was really a giant. He wasn't a small dude. And the Bible says that Goliath would come to the front lines every day to taunt the Israelites. He, he knew they were scared, and, and, and he was sure that no one had the courage to face him. But almost in a cynical way, the Bible says that Goliath comes to the front lines and he demands the Israelites to choose a man to fight him. 
Now, the interesting thing in my own prophetic imagination is that Goliath demanded a man, but he would end up being defeated by a boy. And so here, David comes now, stepping on the scene, and we are introduced, when we're introduced to the issue, David really wasn't even around, but the text says his brothers were the ones that were fighting, and he was doing what he always did, which was tending his father's sheep. But his father told him to go. He said, check on your brothers in battle. I'm in 1 Samuel chapter 17, and the Bible says that when David arrives, he notices all of the commotion that's going on in the army camp, and he begins to ask questions. Now, I love this next part of the story because God shows me a couple things about people you need to watch out for in order to fulfill the assignment on your life. David steps here on the scene, and he notices a problem. He, begin to, he begins to ask questions about the problem. And the text says in verse 28, when Eliab, David's oldest brother, heard him speaking with the men, says he burned with anger at him and asked, why have you come down here? And with whom did you leave the few sheep in the wilderness? I know how conceited you are, how wicked your heart is. You came down only to watch the battle. That's what his brother said. Now, I already told you earlier that back in chapter 16, David had been anointed by king to be king before this. Now, the interesting thing is that same brother Eliab was there to witness this anointing. So he knew who his brother was. He knew the power that he possessed. And he knew God's hand was on David's life. But yet the Bible says that when he heard David asking questions about the battle, Eliab burned with anger. Somebody say revelation. Here's what the Lord told me. He said, some people, and you, you might find this hard to believe, but there are some people in your life that just don't like you simply because, because of who you are in the spirit. It has nothing to do with how you treated them or even what you've done to them or that you've done anything to them, but they simply don't like you because of the light that you possess on the inside, because the things that you carry on the inside, watch this, reminds them of something that they might be lacking. And here's a really complex thing to comprehend. Some people really think that because they don't like you, God is not supposed to use you. But here's a new flash. You better not let up. You better not dim your light. You better not stoop to their level because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the He that is in the world. So that's the first opposition David had to encounter with people. There's a beef now between him and his brother. And he, his, uh, David is looking like, well, what in the world did I do? I can't even say nothing. You, you know, people get mad. When they don't like you, it don't matter what you do. You can sneeze and they're still going to be upset, you know. So sometimes you just, can't, you just can't please people. I'm still in 1 Samuel chapter 17. It says that King Saul heard that David was asking questions in the camp. And then it says Saul summoned him over to the tent. And David said to Saul, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. But listen at Saul's response here in verse 33. It says, Saul replied, you are not able to go out against this Philistine and fight him. You are only a young man, and he has been a warrior from his youth. And so now we see that Saul didn't think that David was able to handle the task because of what he saw on the outside. And here's a teachable moment. Never allow people to place limitations on your life based on their perspective of you. Because at the end of the day, it's not about what they believe and it's not about what they see, but it's about the fact that you've already been approved by God. What does it make a difference what you see in me when God sees the best in me? I've been approved. I've been stamped. I've been signed. I've been sealed. I've been delivered. God has approved me. And if God approved me, there's nothing you can do to stop it. I'm telling y'all, y'all better be grateful that God doesn't have to ask for their opinion before he decides to choose you. You better be glad he doesn't need anybody's permission before he starts to bless you. You better be glad he doesn't have to consult with anybody before he decides to anoint you. Because if it was up to these people, your life would be just as raggedy as a bowl of yak. You better give God some praise and say, God, I thank you that you are the one in control. You are the one in charge and you don't need anybody's permission.
Because allowing the opinions of people to govern your life can cause you to miscarry the seed of purpose that God has placed on the inside of you. I'm going to say it again for the people because y'all didn't talk. Right. I said allowing the opinions of people to govern your life can cause you to miscarry the seed of purpose that God has placed on the inside of you. The people's opinions should never mean more to you than what God says about you. What did he say? He said, you're more than a conqueror. He said, you're the head and not the tail. He said, you're above and not beneath. He said, you can be a lender and not a borrower. He said, you are loved. He said, you are appreciated. You are honored. You are part of the royal priesthood. You are his child. I'm only concerned about what God says about me. So in order to accomplish the assignment on your life, you have to surround yourself with people that will speak life to you that will encourage you, that, that will, will pray with you and pray you through. And, and, and just do me a favor, just look at somebody and say, no dream killers in this season. No, no dream killers in this season. You, you know what a dream killer is. A dream killer is always the one that's saying, you know, I'm just being realistic and I, I'm just trying to tell you the truth. But every time they come, it's always something negative. Talk about what you can't do and what, what you can't accomplish. That's, that's what you call a dream killer. They say they're looking out for you, but they're trying to kill what God has put on the inside of you no more dream killers in this season you got to give them something called the gift of goodbye 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 I can't talk to you on the phone all night because you're killing me I can't text you all night long because you, you're killing me no I don't want to meet you for lunch I don't want to meet you for brunch because you're killing my dream and God got something in store for me and he's he's deposited something on the inside of me no dream killers in this season y'all sit down you're making me nervous you're making me nervous no dream killers in this season. So David and Saul are having this, this meeting and Saul doubts David's ability. But now what I love is David's response. We might be able to shout a little bit off of this. I don't know. We'll see. David begins to give Saul his resume. He says, one day I was tending my father's sheep and a lion came and a bear came and they tried to take one of my father's sheep. And I was the one that was able to strike it, pull it out of his mouth. And when he came, he turned on me, and then I was the one who killed it. So I know you're not thinking that this giant here would be able to stop me if I was able to do that. He said, and the same God who delivered me from the lion and the bear, the same God who delivered me from the lion and the bear is going to deliver me from this Philistine. So here's your next nugget. In this season of your life, you're going to have to use your track record with God from the past to fuel your faith for the future. And when it seems like it's falling apart and it seems like your faith is failing you and the people around you are doubting that you can overcome, you got to poke your chest out. You got to hold your head up. You got to pat yourself on the back. You got to do like David said and encourage yourself. And you have to tell yourself, self, you got a track record with God. He's a God that's been faithful. He, he's a God that's carried you up until now. He, he's a God that's been consistent. You got to remind yourself how how God has kept you. Remind yourself how God has saved you. Remind yourself how God has blessed you. Remind yourself how God has delivered you. And if he did it back then, I'm just crazy enough to believe he's able to do it again for me. In other words, David said the same God who delivered me from that back there is definitely able to deliver me from that up there and 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 so think about your worst season in your life in the past and and how you didn't know how you were going to make it through and how you can see the light at the end of the tunnel but now some kind of way you can look back and say god there was nobody nobody but you i I was really down. I, I was really out. I was at my lowest, and I didn't know how I was going to find my way out. But, but if he was able to do it back then, I got a track record with God. So after David said this, Saul allows him to go. And the Bible says that Saul tries to put his armor on David. And David tries it on. 
tries to walk around in it, you know, try to feel it out, figure out how he's going to fight. He said, I can't fight with your armor because it's too big and it doesn't fit. Some translation says it doesn't fit. And many at first glance might think that he only meant that it didn't fit physically. And that was true to a certain extent, Dr. Cocobell, but more importantly, it didn't fit spiritually. Because guess what? If I use what you have, then you might be able to take credit for what I did. <laughs> but if I use what God gave me, nobody else can get the glory. But And watch this. A lot of people have been unproductive within their purpose because you're trying to do something God called you to do while trying to be like somebody else. But God says you have to be authentically you and let him work out the rest. Look at somebody say, I just got to be me. I just got to be me. I'm not going to try to change who I am to fit you. I'm not going to try to change who I am to suit you. You can like it, don't like it. I don't care, but I have to be who God called me to be. You walk your journey, I walk my journey. And guess what? We'll meet somewhere in the middle. So we're... Coming down to the conclusion now, now we're here at the part that everybody talks about. Y'all know how I like to build the suspense up, you know. <laughs> it's the showdown that everybody had been waiting for. That Donald, a teenage boy, takes a slingshot, five stones, and stands up against a giant. Can't you see it on the front page news? Goliath already thinks he has won the battle. And the other soldiers are already looking at David thinking that he is crazy. And he's a dead man walking. But the Bible says, I feel like preaching just a little bit, that David took that slingshot and he took those few stones and and David told Goliath, he said, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin. He said, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. And I come to let you know that people might have counted you out. And they might have said you wouldn't overcome your giants. I feel like preaching just a little while. Y'all don't mind, do you? Yeah. He said you wouldn't be able to overcome your habits. They said you wouldn't be able to overcome your hang-ups. Uh, but here it is. They didn't realize that the giants, when you were getting ready to face your giants, you were not coming in your own strength. Uh, you were not coming in your own power. Uh, but you have a source of power that you can draw from. Uh, and the power says it like this. It's greater than yourself. Uh, and you might ask the question, Brother Priest, where is this power coming from? But the book of Jews said it like this. It said, now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before his presence with exceeding joy. I wonder if there's anybody in the room this morning that knows the kind of power that I'm talking about. It's the same power that walked around with the three Hebrew boys in the fiery furnace and didn't allow them to get burned. Uh, anybody know the power I'm talking about? Uh, it's the same power that gave Samson the strength to fight in the battle. Uh, and he was the strongest man in the land. Uh, anybody know the power I'm talking about? Uh, it's the same power that calls blind eyes to see uh, and calls deaf ears to hear. Uh, anybody know the power I'm talking about? Uh, it's the same power that brought Lazarus back to life. Uh, anybody know the power Power I'm talking about. Huh? It's the same power that when there was a man named Jesus huh, that died on a cross for you and for me huh, one Friday 
tonight. Uh, it's the same power uh, that raised him early Sunday morning uh, from the dead. Uh, and because he had that power, uh, we got the power to conquer our giants. Uh, this morning, is there anybody in here uh, that can take a few moments and give God some praise uh, for the times in your life where God stepped on the scene uh, and flipped the script of your life? Uh, is there anybody in here uh, that knows the power that I'm talking about? Uh, that God helped you conquer uh, what was conquering you. Uh, he helped you to stand firm in the power uh, of his might, uh, in power and in strength. Uh, I got to go now, Donna, but I feel like preaching just a little while longer. Uh, do me a favor and look at your neighbor and say neighbor. Uh, I said look at your neighbor and say neighbor. Uh, that's not good enough. Turn to somebody else and say neighbor. Look at somebody and say, I believe God is getting ready to do something supernatural in your life. Look at somebody and say, I believe. I, I believe that God is getting ready to help you slay your giant. I believe uh, that God is getting ready uh, to blow your mind. Uh, I believe uh, that God is getting ready uh, to push you into your purpose. Uh, there's an assignment on your life. Uh, there's a calling on your life. Uh, there's a purpose on your life. Uh, and you're the right one for the job. Uh, look at the people on your row and say, I'm the right one for the job. Uh, you're the right one for the job. Uh, and no doubt devil in hell can stop you uh, because if God be for you uh, he's more than the world against you I don't care how dark the day might look uh, I don't care how dark the night might be uh, I don't care how long the night might be uh, God is able to push you into where he wants you to be uh, now unto him who is able uh, if God was able to do it back then uh, I'm crazy enough to believe he can do it again won't he do it somebody to say yeah won't it fight your battles won't it make your enemies your footstool won't it dry your tears won't it do it throw your head back and say yes and give them some praise right through here come on give them some praise come on give them some praise come on give them some glory if you believe you're the right one for the job Listen, lift your hands all over the house because I'm over my time already. We give God praise now. If you know this word was for you, lift it high, lift it high. Because I don't know what capacity you work in, serve in, live, any of those things. But I do know that there's an assignment on your life. There's a calling on your life that's bigger than you are. God says that he's in the, in the business right now in the season of enlarging your territory. But enlarging your territory make, takes more resources. And it takes more faith to be able to expand. Some of you are in a very uncomfortable place right now and you can't put your finger on it. I'm in a place where I'm just unsettled and I just feel like I'm being stretched. And that's exactly what it is. It's God stretching you because there's something better on the other side. And you might say, Lord, I don't know how I'm going to make this happen. I don't know how I'm going to pull all the resources together. I don't have the money. I don't have all the things that I need in order to make this work. God said, don't worry about it. Don't worry about the fear. Don't worry about the anxiety that comes along with it. There is an assignment on your life. He said, and I'm going to give you the strength and the power to tackle these giants so that you can fulfill what I've called you to fulfill. That new career, that new degree, that new business, that LLC, that nonprofit organization. Even some of you, your giants, 
are something that you have to face when you walk through the doors of your home every day. I hear you, Holy Spirit. And you feel yourself uncomfortable and unsettled even in your own household. But I speak to you now and I say greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Don't you stop praying. Don't you stop fasting. I'm talking to someone in here. Don't you stop pressing. Do not come out of that prayer closet and do not come out of that secret place until it breaks. I'm telling you now with that hand lifted up, if that's you I'm talking to, this is a prophetic moment and a prophetic word for you to launch you into your destiny. Let this word be your sign that this is your time and you are the right one for the job, whatever that job is. The job is the calling or the assignment or the word that was spoken over your life that God put in place before the very foundations of the world. And the giant is a byproduct of that assignment. Because in order to remain anointed and keep the oil, there are some things that you have to go through in order to stay in the place God wants you to be. And so yes, this giant is tough, it's big, it's large, it's something that's too much for you. But there's too much depending and riding on your obedience. Because if you look at the scripture, David said, I'm going to slay you. I'm going to kill you. The Bible says that after he hit him with the stone, he cut his head off. And remember last, uh, last Sunday, Pastor talked about making sure we get things from the root. Because once you cut it from the root, you know it's not going to come back ever again. But then he said, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. You tackling this giant could be somebody else's salvation, could be somebody else's breakthrough, could be somebody else's deliverance. So lift their hands, we're gonna pray. Only lift it if you receive the word. Only lift it if you receive the word, because we wanna know. And this is your opportunity to respond. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for every individual under the sound of my voice, even those who are worshiping at home. Mm. And I thank you, Lord, that they are going to make it. <laughs> no matter what comes their way, no matter how big the giant is. I thank you, Father, for the words you've told us. That we are not to be concerned about the opinions of others. That we are to surround ourselves with people who speak faith into our lives. That can pray us through and to pray us out. We thank you, O oh Father, that, Lord, you have an anointed us and the anointing is enough to get us through this assignment. So, Father, I pray in Jesus' name that you would give strength to each and every individual, not their own strength, but supernatural power, dunamis power, glory be to God, the only power that comes from the Holy Spirit to be able to tackle whatever it is that they're facing give you praise and we give you glory now in Jesus name all of God's people said amen if you receive that word put your hands together give them some praise before you leave everyone standing for me if you would rest on your feet this is the time we want to give you to respond to this word the doors of the church are open as we say in the traditional sense but they really never closed what we're doing is now introducing you to Jesus Christ if you do not know Jesus and the pardon of your sins that means you don't have a personal relationship with him and you never said, Lord, I want to make you the center of my life. This is your opportunity now. The altar is open. We want you to walk down the aisle so we can see who you are. We want to greet you. We want to love on you in the name of Jesus the Christ. Come on, let's put our hands together. Give God some praise. Hi, glory. Thank you. Come on, let's greet our sister. Is there another? We don't want to rush the moment. If there's another person, Oh, come on, let's give God some praise. Come on, come on, come on, come on. 